we have a double standard, which is to say, a man can show how much he cares by being violent. See, he's jealous, he cares. A woman shows how much she cares by how much she's willing to be hurt, by how much she will take, how much she will endure. Rome in the summer of 1638, mid-morning on a day of sultry and oppressive heat. At the door of her house in a narrow street near the Palazzo Quirinale stands Costanza Piccolomini, wife of the sculptor Matteo Bonarelli. Her husband is at his work on the other side of the Tiber at St. Peter's, carving stone for the never-ending refurbishment of the great basilica. Costanza is saying goodbye to a young man. He has been in her company for some hours. She is only partly dressed, and after closing her door, she returns to bed. As the man walks away, he is watched by another man, sitting in a closed carriage that stands a little way along from the house, where the street opens out into a small square. With a clatter of hooves, the carriage abruptly moves off after him. Shortly afterwards, and not far from where Costanza now lies in her bed, angry cries and violent blows disturb the peace of the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore. After chasing him with a drawn sword through the streets and squares, and kicking open the doors of the church, the pursuer has caught the man who was with Costanza that morning. He picks up an iron bar and beats the man with savage ferocity, breaking two of his ribs. The man begs for mercy. His assailant throws down the iron bar and turns away. He strides out of the church and into the streets of Rome and returns to his home. But it is not over. He lies broken and bleeding, but she, too, must pay. The man summons a servant and gives him certain orders. Later that morning, Costanza's rest is disturbed by a knock at the door. A man is admitted, carrying two flasks of Greek wine. He is a servant of a man Costanza knows well. The wine is a gift. She accepts the wine, but the man does not bow and withdraw. Instead, suddenly, there is a knife in his hand. The blade makes a glittering arc through the air. Costanza cries out, her hand to her cheek, blood dripping through her fingers. The man behind this assault, the man at the heart of the violent sequence of events on this summer morning in Rome, is the famous sculptor Gian Lorenzo Bernini. He has been Costanza's lover for two years. But this is not just jealousy, not just passion. It is family. For the other man, the man he saw leaving the house, the bed of the woman he loved, is his brother Luigi. It was Bernini who, possessed by jealous suspicion, kept watch on his lover's house until he had the proof he needed that she had dishonoured and betrayed him, as he saw it, and not just with any man, but with his own brother. It was Bernini who, possessed by a violent rage that terrified all who saw him, pursued his brother through the streets of Rome and beat him to within an inch of his life. It was Bernini who called a servant to him, gave him wine and a knife, and told him, Go on my behalf to Signora Costanza, and present her with this, and, at the right moment, slash her. The account you have just heard is based on contemporary documents. Those documentary sources are reproduced in this book, Bernini's Beloved by Sarah McPhee, 
which is the essential scholarly account of the affair, the assault, and above all, of the life of Costanza Piccolomini. Dr. McPhee is an expert on Bernini and is Professor of Art History at Emory University, Atlanta. I have drawn upon her book extensively in this film and recommend it very highly. This is Costanza Piccolomini, sculpted in marble by Gian Lorenzo Bernini in 1636. Costanza was born in Viterbo, about 80 kilometers to the north of Rome, probably in 1614, but grew up in Rome. Her family lived in respectable but modest circumstances. Her father was a footman in a noble household. But by descent she was a member of the aristocratic Piccolomini family of Siena, among the greatest of Italian noble houses, and she proudly bore the Piccolomini name throughout her life as both an unmarried and a married woman. She married in 1632. Her husband was Matteo Bonacelli, a sculptor from Lucca, who also bought, sold, and restored sculptures, antiquities, and copies of ancient sculptures. They moved together into a house on Vicolo Scanderbeg, a narrow street near the Palazzo Quirinale. In fact, the front door of the house is directly opposite the foot of the stairway that leads up to the west side of the palace. At this time, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, who had been appointed the architect of St. Peter's Basilica in 1629, and was the right-hand man of Pope Urban VIII when it came to anything sculptural or architectural, was recreating Baroque art and Baroque Rome itself. He had already produced works which revolutionized European sculpture, while his transformations of St. Peter's included the famous Baldacchino and the sculptural embellishment of the crossing piers, and his funerary monument to Urban VIII. His work and his genius placed him at the heart of the church and at the heart of Rome, but he did not do this work alone. He had many sculptors to assist him. Matteo Bonacelli was one. He began to work for Bernini at St. Peter's in 1636. At some point about this time, the unmarried Bernini, nearing forty, and Costanza, married and in her early twenties, began an affair. And soon Bernini carved this bust of her, not for any client or patron, but for himself. He also painted portraits of her, although those paintings are now lost. The bust, carved in marble, is seventy-two centimetres high, so Costanza's head is roughly life-size. It is a unique work, both for Bernini and for the time. This is a private work of art, made for the sculptor for himself alone, and it breaks all the rules of contemporary portrait sculpture. Portrait sculpture in the 17th century was an essentially public-facing art. It was itself a public art form, and it represented the public face of its subjects. Bernini's portrait busts are overwhelmingly of male subjects. From around sixty confirmed and surviving busts, just three are of women. The subjects are Camilla Barbadoni, Diana di Paolo Roschioli, and Costanza Piccolomini. His depictions of Camilla Barbadoni and Diana di Paolo Roschioli, both the mothers of important and influential men, show their aristocratic subjects with formality and decorum. If we look at busts of women by other Baroque sculptors, the same applies. The portrait of Maria Duglioli Barberini from around 1627 was initially attributed to Bernini, but is now accepted to be by Bernini's rival and former pupil, Giuliano Finelli. It portrays its subject with stiff formality, in elaborate clothing. This tradition continued throughout the 17th century, with Giovanni Battista Foggini's portrayal of Vittoria di Rovere from circa 1690 showing a similar formality in posture and attire. Bernini's Costanza is very different. For all Costanza's aristocratic descent, it is not a portrayal of a woman of high social status. Both she and her husband had to work for a living, and this has indeed been called the first portrait of a middle-class woman 
in European art history. Then there is her attire. It is far from formal. She is simply wearing her chemise, the item of clothing that goes under everything else and is worn next to the skin. The front hangs open. It is an intimate, even potentially an indecent, depiction. To see a respectable woman of seventeenth-century Rome in her chemise, you would have to know her very well indeed. And her posture is informal. The eyes of the formal portraits gaze stiffly forward from heads held level, and with mouths firmly and respectably closed. Costanza's head is turned, as if she is momentarily reacting to something happening around her. Her eyes seem to sparkle and flash, and her lips daringly are parted, with teeth visible between them. She may be about to smile, or she may be about to speak, and indeed this has been called a speaking likeness. This work of art constantly provokes the imagination to ask, what has just happened? Or perhaps, what happens next? The hair is textured in a willfully rough manner, suggesting youthful energy and sensuality, bringing out through contrast the smoothness of the skin. It is tousled and unkempt, in keeping with the rest of her appearance, but has been gathered at the back. Yet one coil of hair has escaped being bound up with the rest, and lies provocatively upon her bare neck. It is a powerfully physical and sensual depiction, quite exceptional for seventeenth-century portrait sculpture. There is no doubting the love, passion, and the history of intimacy that lies behind this portrayal. This bust was private, but it was not secret. It was on display in Bernini's house, and visitors saw it there and praised it. Presumably it was an object of pride for Bernini. He was a powerful man, in a world where powerful men could get what they wanted. He may have carved this portrait not only for his own pleasure, but to provoke admiration and envy, for his genius, and for the things he possessed, or at least the things he claimed for himself including the beautiful, passionate, and desirable woman depicted in this sculpture. This is the face Bernini loved, and the face he told his servant to slash with a knife. The crime of face-slashing was not uncommon in seventeenth-century Italy, with women overwhelmingly being the victims. It was an act intended to punish and shame. Judicial authorities took the crime seriously, and penalties were severe, both for those who carried out the slashing and those who commissioned it. In Costanza's case, nothing more is heard of the servant who actually committed the deed, but everyone knew Bernini was ultimately responsible for what was done to her. So you might be asking, what happened to Bernini? Was he arrested and punished? No. He wasn't. But Costanza was. We do not know the date of the attack on Costanza, but it occurred in the late summer, at the end of August, or during September. The wound in her cheek was treated at her home by a barber surgeon over some weeks, as it had become infected, and recovery was painful and difficult. Then, in late November or early December, Costanza was arrested at her home and taken forcibly into confinement. The arrest was made under the authority of the papal government of Rome, although Costanza did not find that out until much later. There was an institutional system in Rome, as in almost all European towns and cities, for the incarceration and, at least in theory, reformation of fallen women. Women who, through their conduct, or simply on the grounds of allegations made about them by others, were judged to have fallen short of society's standards of morality, specifically sexual morality. No such system, it need hardly be added, existed for men. Fallen women were judged harshly by society and the authorities, and the events which had taken place had revealed that Costanza Piccolomini wife of Matteo Bonacelli, was such a woman. In reality, of course, the affair had been known about before, but its violent end, and the withdrawal of Bernini's protection, 
meant that Costanza was now exposed to the full force of moral censure and official retribution. No more blind eyes would be turned, at least not for Costanza. Costanza was confined in the establishment known as the Casa Pia, near the Pantheon in central Rome. Such places were to some degree safe havens for women and girls who were being drawn into or were escaping prostitution, but they were also places of punitive confinement. Costanza was guilty of adultery. Men, particularly if of high social status, were generally required simply to pay a sum in compensation to the husband of the woman with whom they had been intimate, but women were treated very differently, the underlying principle being that in adultery, if a woman goes wrong, it is the woman's fault, but if a man goes wrong, that's the woman's fault too. Sarah McPhee describes the position Costanza was in. For women, there were prescribed rituals of public humiliation and mandatory confinement. If Costanza's punishment followed the legal course, she was whipped, shorn of her famous locks, and sent to the Casa Pia to await her husband's forgiveness for as long as two years. Costanza was enclosed in the Casa Pia throughout the winter of 1638-9. to In the spring of 1639, she wrote a letter to the governor of Rome, in which she says that she has been confined for four months, that she is sick, deprived of hope, shut away and abandoned by everyone, and that she does not have food, medical treatment, all the things she needs, being dependent on the charity of the other women in the Casa Pia. She asks the governor either to provide her with help or to approve her release. She had assumed that her arrest had taken place on the authority of her husband, but only months later did she discover that it was nothing to do with him, but that she had been arrested on the governor's authority. Hence, she was making her appeal to him. The governor approved her release into the care of her husband, and she returned to the house in Vicolo Skanderbeg. She remained with her husband, and her husband continued to work for Bernini. Bernini's brother Luigi fled to Bologna following the assault in Santa Maria Maggiore. Bernini himself had quietly left Rome in the aftermath of that day of violence to await an official response to his behaviour. He knew his future lay in the hands of the Pope. Meanwhile, his mother wrote to the Pope's nephew, explaining that her son's behaviour amounted to a fit of madness and begging that he be treated leniently. In truth, she was pushing at an open door. The church authorities in Rome valued Bernini far too highly to allow him to face any serious penalty for his actions. And in the end, he faced no penalty at all. He was absolved of any crime by the papal government, and a fine of 3,000 scudi that had initially been imposed upon him was rescinded. The Pope invited him to return to Rome and continue his work, addressing him as sublime genius, born according to a divine plan for the glory of Rome. When Bernini's son Domenico wrote a biography of his father, he stated that he was absolved for no other motive than because he was excellent in art. The Pope also told Bernini to get married, and even provided a suitable wife. Within a year of the violent end of his affair with Costanza, Bernini was indeed married. He settled down and devoted the rest of his life to his art and to his family of, ultimately, eleven children. For the assault on Costanza, he suffered no consequences and paid no penalty. Just after his marriage, he disposed of the bust of Costanza. It passed through various hands and ended up in Florence, where it remains today. And what of Costanza herself? Costanza Piccolomini was a strong, courageous, and admirable woman. Despite the brutal attack she had suffered in her own home, despite her imprisonment and public disgrace, she was not a shamed and broken creature. She showed her face with its scars to the world and got on with her life. And it was an active and prosperous life. 
she shared in her husband's work of making, trading in, and restoring sculpture until his death in 1654, then carried on the business successfully on her own, becoming known as Costanza Scultora. She became rich and respected, and acquired an impressive art collection. In 1655 she gave birth to a daughter, Olympia Caterina Piccolomini. The identity of the father is not known for certain, but Sarah McPhee suggests that he was Domenico Salvetti, a canon of Santa Maria Maggiore, an influential officeholder at the Vatican, and, like Costanza, a great art collector. Costanza died in 1662, leaving to her daughter a substantial estate and a noble name.